in the late 1980s, Airbus was ready to take on Goliath. Boeing had ruled the skies for decades, and their crown jewel, the 747, was the undisputed king of long-haul travel. But Airbus had something different in mind. Not a faster jet, not a lighter one. They wanted to build the biggest passenger aircraft the world had ever seen. It wasn't just about size, it was about status. The A380 would be more than a machine. It would be a flying symbol of ambition, a bold European answer to Boeing's dominance. At full capacity, it could carry over 850 passengers. That's not a plane, that's a small city with wings. But building something this massive wasn't just a design challenge. It was an act of defiance against gravity itself. We're talking about a 560-ton aircraft. Four decks, two for passengers, two hidden below for cargo and systems. The wingspan? Nearly 80 meters wide. It needed 22 wheels to land safely. And the engines, four Rolls-Royce Trent 9s, were each as tall as a grown man and powerful enough to lift a fully loaded 737 by themselves. How do you even start designing something like that? Airbus engineers had to invent new materials and rethink everything from hydraulics to cabin pressurization. The fuselage was so wide, they had to use aluminum alloys reinforced with carbon composites just to keep it from sagging under its own weight. And the wings, those wings had to flex, bend and carry unimaginable loads without tearing apart at 35,000 feet. Inside, the plane was equally ambitious. Not just rows of seats, but the promise of lounges, cocktail bars, private suites, and even onboard showers. It was meant to revive the golden age of air travel in a world that had grown used to flying like sardines. But behind the engineering marvel was a massive gamble. Airbus estimated development would cost $10 billion. It ended up closer to $25 billion. Governments had to step in with loans, production delays mounted, and early buyers grew anxious. Still, when the A380 finally took to the skies for its maiden fly in 2005, it stunned the world. Smooth, silent, enormous. Airports scrambled to widen runways, reinforce taxiways, and build double-decker boarding gates. Airlines marketed it as the future of flight. And for a brief moment, it felt like Airbus had changed everything. But while the A380 may have conquered engineering, it was still flying headfirst into an evolving world. A world that was starting to prefer something else entirely. When Airbus unveiled the A380 to the public, it wasn't just promoting a new aircraft, it was selling a dream. A return to elegance, space, quiet, comfort. No more crammed knees or overhead bins bursting at the seams. The A380 would offer something air travel had lost, dignity. On paper, it was everything passengers wanted. Spiral staircases connected its two full-length decks. Some airlines envisioned onboard lounges, cocktail bars, and even showers at 35,000 feet. First-class suites offered sliding doors, full beds, and fine dining. In a time when most flying felt like endurance, this was indulgence. For a brief moment, it worked. Emirates, the A380's biggest believer, went all in. They turned their fleet into flying hotels, private cabins, chandeliers in the bar, even a spa. For high-paying passengers, it was the closest thing to flying like royalty. But for most airlines, reality looked very different. Margins in aviation are razor thin. Flying an A380 meant burning more fuel, paying higher landing fees, and loading hundreds of passengers, just to break even. The lounges disappeared. The bars were replaced with rows of seats. And while the aircraft could carry over 800 passengers, few airlines dared to pack it that full. Most stuck to 450 to 600, making room for comfort, but sacrificing efficiency. Then came the real twist. The A380 was designed for a hub-to-hub -hub model. Mega airports like London Heathrow, Singapore Changi, or Dubai would serve as centralized launch pads. From there, smaller aircraft would fan out to final destinations. Airbus believed air traffic would grow so dense that large planes would be the only solution. 
but the industry had other plans. In the mid-2000s, Boeing doubled down on the point-to-point -point model, using fuel-efficient twin-engine jets like the 787 Dreamliner to skip the hubs altogether. Passengers could now fly directly from Boston to Madrid or Tokyo to San Jose without layovers. The A380 was still taxing out of hangars when the future had already taken off. That shift changed everything. Why wait in line at Dubai or Frankfurt when you could board a smaller jet and go straight to where you needed to be? Airlines realized they could fly more frequently to more destinations with fewer passengers and do it all with smaller planes that cost less to run. Suddenly, the A380 looked like a luxurious answer to a question no one was asking anymore. And geography didn't help either. US carriers, the world's largest market, never ordered a single A380. American runways weren't built for it, nor was their business model. Outside of Emirates and a few Asian and European carriers, the aircraft struggled to find a home. It wasn't a lack of love, it was a lack of fit. The A380 was a miracle of comfort, but it was a product of another time. A flying palace, absolutely. But in a world that had moved on, it no longer had a kingdom. Let's be clear, the Airbus A380 is not a failure of engineering. In fact, it may be one of the most technically impressive aircraft ever built. But that's what makes its story so fascinating, because it wasn't outbuilt. It was out-evolved. Every part of the A380 had to break new ground. The wing alone is a masterpiece. At nearly 80 meters wide, it had to flex over seven feet during flight, balancing lift and weight like a dancer on a tightrope. The landing gear, designed to absorb a touchdown force from over 1.2 million pounds of aircraft and cargo, spread across 22 wheels. The flight deck used advanced fly-by-wire technology and the cabin pressurization system had to manage two massive decks filled with people while keeping things whisper quiet. But building a masterpiece doesn't guarantee it belongs in the museum of the future. The problem wasn't how the A380 flew, it was how much it cost to keep it flying. With four enormous engines and heavy infrastructure requirements, the aircraft demanded fuel in quantities that simply didn't make sense in a world chasing lower emissions and tighter margins. While the A380 burned fuel across four engines, Aircraft like the Boeing 787 and Airbus's own A350 were gliding across oceans with just two, cleaner, quieter, and far cheaper to operate. The numbers spoke loudly. An A380 needed to be at least 80% full to be profitable. A 787 could make money with half the load. And the infrastructure? That was a headache of its own. Most airports weren't ready for something this big. Runways had to be widened, jet bridges had to be extended, gates had to be specially reinforced. For every A380 that flew, ground crews had to adapt. For smaller airlines and regional airports, that just wasn't worth the trouble. Then there was cargo, the quiet profit center of modern aviation. In most twin-engine jets, cargo containers fit easily into the belly. But the A380's lower deck was so full of systems and space-consuming architecture that its cargo capacity was surprisingly underwhelming. A Boeing 777, far smaller and cheaper, could carry more freight and still fly more routes, more frequently. It wasn't just about capacity, it was about adaptability. The world was demanding nimble jets that could crisscross secondary cities, adjust quickly to demand, and serve thinner routes efficiently. The A380, as brilliant as it was, couldn't pivot. It was a four-engine solution in a two-engine world. And perhaps that's the most difficult truth of all. Airbus built something extraordinary, but even extraordinary has to fit its moment in time. The A380 may have been built for a world of mega hubs and ever denser skies, but aviation evolves sideways, not upward. It didn't need bigger, it needed smarter. And in that future, the giant began to look like a beautiful lumbering relic, an engineering marvel that arrived just a little too late. In 2019, Airbus made it official.
production of the A380 would end. The decision hit hard, not just for the engineers who spent decades perfecting the aircraft or the airlines that had invested billions, but for aviation fans around the world. The largest, most ambitious passenger aircraft ever built was being retired. Just 14 years after it first entered service, the news wasn't unexpected. Orders had slowed to a trickle. Emirates, the program's biggest supporter, had reduced its final commitments. Airlines were chasing efficiency, not spectacle, but that didn't make the farewell any easier. The final aircraft rolled out of the Toulouse factory in 2021. Tail number A6 EVIS. Destination, Dubai, the end of a chapter. And yet, the beginning of something else, because the A380 never flew quietly, not even into retirement. Pilots who flew it described it not just as powerful, but graceful. Smooth in turbulence, surprisingly agile for its size. Cabin crew spoke of working on a plane that made passengers smile just by boarding. And passengers, they remembered the quiet, the space, the feeling that for once, flying felt special again. Then came the pandemic. As COVID-19 shut down global travel, the A380 was among the first aircraft grounded. Airlines stored them in deserts, mothballed them in remote airfields. Some were scrapped early, others sat idle, collecting dust and doubt. Aviation insiders assumed the aircraft would never return to service. The world was different now, leaner, more cautious. The A380, they said, was finished. But then, something unexpected happened. As international travel surged back, long-haul demand skyrocketed. Airports were congested, crew shortages and slot limits created bottlenecks. And suddenly, the A380's strengths mattered again. One plane, 500 passengers, fewer takeoffs, lower staffing needs per seat. Emirates brought theirs back. So did Singapore Airlines, British Airways, Qantas, Lufthansa. Passengers rushed to book them, not just for convenience, but for the experience. Social media platforms exploded with cabin tours, upper deck walkthroughs, and wide-eyed first-time flyers discovering the magic of the double-decker jet. In its second life, the A380 wasn't just a plane, it was a celebrity. And maybe that was its purpose all along, not to dominate the skies forever, not to outmatch every rival on fuel burn or cargo volume, but to remind us what aviation once was and could still be. Grand, comfortable, beautiful. Because while airlines measure profit by the seat and mile, passengers remember something else entirely. The feeling of flying, the space to stretch your legs, the silence of the cabin, the memory of walking up a staircase in the sky, so yes, the A380 may have been born in the wrong decade. It may have cost too much, flown too few routes, and required too many compromises. But it also gave millions of people a glimpse, however brief, of what flying could feel like when ambition led the way. And maybe that was what the A380 was really for. What's your most memorable A380 experience? Let us know in the comments.